special counsel to investigate and prosecute violations of prohibited personnel practices, especially whistleblowing. In order for the OSC to complete its mission, agencies are required to produce complete and unredacted documents to the Office of Special Counsel. Unfortunately, the TSA is not fulfilling their legal obligation to produce documents, frustrating OSC's investigative efforts. And I can tell you with a passion on both sides of this aisle, it is not acceptable to withhold information. Um, it is something we have both committed to on both sides of the aisle to help protect and ensure that whistleblowers are protected. You have a right in this government as a government employee to blow the whistle. But when the TSA withholds documents and does not allow the OSC to do its job, that's wholly unacceptable. Former TSA Administrator Peter Neffinger testified before the committee last May that the TSA would base its response to allegations of whistleblower retaliation on OSC's findings. But now TSA is withholding the documents OSC needs to complete its investigation. So on one hand you have the TSA Administrator saying, oh we're going to base our conclusions on the findings of OSC, but the TSA won't give all the information to the OSC. Today, I do not want to hear about how vol voluminous the documents are. I don't want to hear about how many you've given them. There is but one metric that is important to me, and that is the percentage. If you dare go to the place to tell us about how many documents you've turned over, every time you do so, we will ask you what percentage of the documents did you actually turn over. TSA is one of the agencies uh, in most need of the OSC's work. Since 2012, the OSC received approximately 243 cases from TSA employees alleging retaliation for blowing the whistle. A lot happens, very few blow the whistle, but when they blow the whistle, to have 243 people say that there was retaliation is a number that is a flashing red light and scares us. The committee is constantly hearing how complaints from TSA employees about how the agency is a hostile work environment for whistleblowers. It has been almost a year since our last hearing on the mismanagement at the agency. It's disheartening that we find ourselves here again. It's frustrating and it shouldn't happen. TSA selectively withholds information from OSC by asserting a common law attorney-client privilege that does not apply to interagency disputes. TSA's chief counsel, Francine Kerner, the agency's chief counsel since the agency's inception more than 15 years ago, could not identify the client holding the privilege. When pressed, Kerner informed the staff that, quote, TSA has no legal obligation to turn over documents to the OSC, end quote. Kerner's inability as chief counsel to articulate who she represents and her withholding of information shows a fundamental misunderstanding and antagonism towards the OSC's function. Interestingly, the TSA later sent the committee a letter stating, quote, TSA recognizes its legal obligation to provide documents to the OSC and does so regularly, end quote. In fact, I'd ask you to have consent to enter that uh, letter into the record. It was sent to us on March 4th without objection, so ordered. Uh, it was sent to us March 1st, 2017. It's not about doing it regularly, it's about doing it always. And that is something that drives us here today. The OSC gets to see all of it, 100% of it. Not a portion of it, not some of it, not just the parts you want them to see. The OSC gets to see all of it. That means 100%. Furthermore, it should not take a congressional hearing for the TSA to acknowledge an existing legal obligation. Similar to the agency's non-cooperation with the OSC, the committee has long criticized the agency's use of sensitive security information, an SSI designation to withhold information. In a 2014, in 2014, the committee issued a bipartisan report, bipartisan, finding that the agency inconsistently and improperly designated certain information as SSI simply to prevent embarrassing information from being made public. But these problems persist. persist. According to the Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General, quote, TSA is abusing its stewardship of the SSI program. None of these redactions will make us safer and simply highlight the inconsistent and arbitrary nature of decisions that C TSA cannot be trusted to administer the program in a reasonable manner." End quote. That's about as damning as it gets. That is as direct as it can possibly be. 
In a recent transcribed interview with the committee, former TSA Deputy Administrator Mark Hatfield told the committee, and I quote, you could mark a Chinese carryout menu SSI, end quote. Talk about an abuse of the system. A Chinese menu, that was his example. The issue with the transparency at TSA tend to have one thing in common, and that's Francine Kerner, the Office of Chief Counsel. She seems to be the conduit and the person that we continually bump into. Kerner has checkered history and the duty, and it has a duty to share information. As a lawyer for the Treasury Department in the early 1990s, she was the subject of an investigation for improperly disclosing confidential information to the White House. Now she's advocating for the TSA to withhold information on alleged whistleblower retaliation from the agency charged to investigate it. There's something fundamentally totally wrong and backwards about that. The committee will not tolerate these impediments, especially when it comes to protecting whistleblowers and ensuring transparency. The acting administrator uh, is here today. We're, we're requesting today you right this wrong and immediately turn over all information withheld from the OSC and put an end to the practice. We're going to be a very short timeline to do so, and we will follow up. Let's now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Cummings of Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, last week, our committee conducted an extraordinary interview at my request with Mark Hatfield, who served as the Deputy Administrator of the TSA and worked at the agency for some 13 years. He explained to the committee that TSA employees lack some of the most basic safeguards to protect them against retaliation when they highlight security concerns. The Deputy described an agency where, in the absence of normal federal employee safeguards, a culture of retribution and arbitrary personnel actions evolved that made employees reluctant to raise security concerns. I will highlight some of the statements made by the deputy during his interview, and I ask unanimous consent to include longer excerpts in the hearing record. With respect to the subject of today's hearing, the deputy explained, quote, there was very little transparency. There was a lot of distrust. There was a sense of, you know, in favor and out of favor employees, end of quote. He explained, quote, so many things were governed by self-direction at TSA, it bred misbehavior, end of quote. He said the lack of protections for employees, quote, gave people the opportunity to do things that were typically not against the rules because the rules were so flexible, but very questionable when you looked at it from a moral or ethical point of view, end of quote. During the deputy's interview, our staff asked him if the absence of normal federal employee safeguards contributed to an environment in which employees did not want to come forward with information about security. In response, he said, and, and again I quote, oh yeah, I mean, it, it didn't take long for you to know enough of your compatriots uh, had, you, you know, taken an arrow in the back and, and you know were either wounded or dead and you had a decision to make depending on how loud you wanted to be or how far you wanted to go, end of quote. The deputy also warned, and I quote, people learned that if you spoke too loudly or if you questioned whether the emperor was actually wearing clothes or not, that you could do it at, you know, personal consequence, end of quote. When Congress created the TSA in 2001, it did not provide the agency's employees with all of the due process protections given to other federal employees under Title V. The deputy said that although some flexibility might have been appropriate, that TSA was first created, the, the, the agency, and I quote, should have started converting some of these practices to make them more standardized in federal government practices, end of quote. He explained, quote, the structure that gave it the flexibility and the facility and the power to make extraordinary moves it did when it was created should have evolved. And unfortunately, 
Some of them have just led to toxicity rather than a healthy agency, end the quote. One tactic reportedly used against TSA employees was, quote, directed reassignments, end of quote, or forcing employees to move entirely to new, entirely, to, to entirely new locations as punishment for raising concerns. I got to tell you, this is something that really bothered me because, and I'm sure it did the chairman, because we had people who were being divided from their families, uh, going, one person going maybe to Connecticut and the other one going to Florida. Give me a break. And it was punishment. Punishment. For example, the deputy explained that the former assistant administrator in charge of the agency security operations ran a, quote, very dictatorial department, end of quote. Rather than focusing on improving security, he was, quote, using the directed reassignment process to manipulate positions in the field and to both help people that were in favor and to punish people that were out of favor, end of quote. The deputy confirmed during his interview that one TSA whistleblower, Jay Brainerd, who testified before this committee on April 27, 2016, received a directed reassignment after being, quote, very outspoken, end of quote, about security concerns. According to Deputy Brainerd, quote, would often raise issues, end of quote, about security, including, quote, the extraordinary emphasis on speed over quality of screening, end of quote. The deputy said uh, that this whistleblower highlighted, quote, what many felt was unreasonable reliance on a metric system that was oftentimes beautiful in full color presentation on slide decks, but was very detached from the reality of the front line where the actions were taking place, end of quote. The deputy also confirmed what we have heard many times before, that TSA has abused the SSI designation to cover up information. He joked that in the early years of the agency, quote, you could mark, and I think the chairman re referred to this, you could mark a Chinese carryout me menu SSI, end of quote. He added, quote, a brochure or something that was clearly public, uh, consumable material or information you could get on the internet or in the library, and they would, you know, stamp it SSI, end of quote. Now, from everything we have seen, TSA operations have improved over the last two years under most recent administrator, Vice Admiral Peter Neffinger. But the deputy's uh, interview last week makes crystal clear that TSA employees need the same protections as other federal employees so they can speak up about the security of American people without being retaliated against. And Congress can consider these reforms. And let me say to the chairman, I thank you again, and I thank all of our members for standing up for whistleblowers. Ladies and gentlemen, if we don't stand up for whistleblowers, we don't need to be here. We need to go and get another job, because as far as I'm concerned, it would be legislative and congressional malpractice not to do so. Some of, the, some of the best information that we have gotten from whistleblowers, and we must do everything in our power at all times to protect them. And on the other hand, for anyone who thinks Congress should receive Title V protection for employees at other federal agencies, TSA is a case study demonstrating why this would be a terrible idea. Uh, and with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I also noticed that Congressman Sarbanes I uh, just came in, and he's one of our newest members. Uh, thank you. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Glad, glad you're here. Um, members are advised that we do anticipate votes on the floor. Uh, we're going to get through the, uh, hopefully get through all of the opening statements, um, but at the appropriate time we will break. The intention is to um, allow the votes on the floor, and then we'll, we'll come back and uh, finish up the hearing. Uh, we'll hold the record open for five legislative days for any members who'd like to submit a written statement. But let's now recognize our, our panel. We're pleased to welcome uh, Ms. Gawadia. She's the Acting Administrator for the Transportation Security Administration. The Honorable John Roth, Inspector General for the United States Department of Homeland Security. And the Honorable Connor, 
Carolyn Lerner, a special counsel for the Office of Special Counsel, special counsel for the United States Office of Special Counsel. Uh, we welcome you all. Pursuant to committee rules, you are to be sworn uh, before you testify. So if you will please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Please be seated and le let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We would appreciate it if you would limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Um, we'll give you a little bit of latitude, but of course your entire written statement will be made part of the record. We'll now recognize the acting administrator for five minutes. And it, it, but by the way, you have to straighten it up and get that microphone right up in there. It's a little uncomfortable, but bring it up close. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Cummings, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for affording me the opportunity and privilege to speak to you today about information transparency at the Transportation Security Administration. I am indeed fortunate to represent a tremendous workforce. For example, TSA uh, 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 redacted, claiming SSI, a statement in one of our draft reports related to expedited screening process. Here's the quote. Passengers are not required to remove shoes, belts, laptops, liquids, or gels, end quote. We showed TSA that this information is on their publicly available website, and pretty much every, under, every traveler who goes through the pre-check lane understands this to be the case. And ultimately, TSA agreed that the information was not, in fact, SSI and should not have been redacted. While this was appropriately resolved, it takes time away from the audit process and causes unnecessary delay. Likewise, we have other instances in which TSA has attempted to restrict information that we found uh, on their own website. These examples highlight what I believe is the incoherent and inconsistent nature of the program and raise serious concerns in my mind as to whether TSA can be trusted to make reasonable, appropriate, and consistent SSI designations. Under DHS policy, any authorized holder of SSI who believes that a designation is improper may challenge the marking. Unfortunately, as I discovered, this appeals process is structured to ratify TSA's SSI designations and prevent the review of such designations by independent external entities. The appeals process is foreordained and fails pro to properly balance the public's right to information against non-speculative threats to aviation security and is vulnerable to abuse. We are currently in the fieldwork stage of a comprehensive review of TSA's management of its SSI program and its use of the SSI designation. We expect to have a final report by July 2017 and will provide a copy of this report prior to its publication to this committee. Additionally, we will continue to review and publish public reports on TSA's programs and operations. To the extent that we continue to observe the abuse of SSI designation, we will continue to highlight it. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. I'm happy to answer any questions you or other members of the committee may have. Thank you. Well, I'll now go to Ms. Lerner. You're now recognized for five minutes. Bring that microphone up nice yep. and close. There you go. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the U.S. Office of Special Counsel and our investigations of whistleblower retaliation at the Transportation Security Administration. I appreciate the committee's commitment to oversight including strengthening OSC's ability to carry out our good government mission. I want to take the opportunity to thank this committee for your leadership in passing the Thoroughly Investigating Retaliation Against Whistleblowers Act, H.R. 69, during the opening week of this Congress. That legislation will help OSC conduct our investigations at TSA and other agencies. During our investigations, it is standard to issue document requests and interview witnesses. A full and complete investigation requires access to all relevant information. Although agencies generally cooperate with OSC's requests, some do not. Some withhold documents and other information by asserting common law privileges, and in particular, the attorney-client privilege. As the committee knows, the attorney-client privilege protects certain communications between a lawyer and client. The privilege allows a client to disclose confidential communications in order to promote frank and candid discussions. As someone who spent two decades practicing law in the private sector, I understand the importance of the privilege, and of course, it helped me to represent my clients. In government, the privilege is certainly important in certain contexts, 
such as in litigation with third parties. Having said that, there is simply no basis for federal agencies to assert the attorney-client privilege during an OSC investigation. This is not litigation. This is an internal administrative investigation that OSC is conducting for the government. Indeed, no court has ever held that the attorney-client privilege can be used during an administrative investigation between two government agencies. This makes sense. We all work for the same government. Congress and this committee in particular have made clear that there is a strong public interest in exposing government wrongdoing and upholding merit system principles. Federal agencies may not use privileges to conceal evidence from the agency that Congress has charged with investigating them. Unfortunately, the TSA has been somewhat of an outlier in its aggressive use of attorney-client privilege in several cases. In 2012, Congress extended whistleblower protections to TSA employees through the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act. Since then, OSC has received more than 350 retaliation cases from the TSA employees. Two pairs of companion cases illustrate the challenges OSC faces in getting needed information from the TSA. The complainants are TSA officials who experienced involuntary geographical reassignments, a demotion, and a removal all allegedly in retaliation for their protected whistleblower disclosures. In these cases, TSA withheld information from its document productions, asserting claims of attorney-client privilege. OSC has asked TSA to withdraw the claims of privilege, but both TSA and DHS rejected these requests. There are several problems with TSA's assertions of privilege. First, as discussed above, Shielding information from OSC conflicts with their statutory mandate to investigate the legality of personnel practices. When TSA doesn't disclose the reasons why they took an action against the whistleblower, we can't investigate whether it's retaliation. In addition, TSA's attorney-client privilege review causes significant delays in investigations. In these four cases, OSC has spent months waiting for documents while TSA was reviewing responses for privilege. OSC is a tiny agency. We only have about 40 attorneys to investigate hundreds of retaliation cases. Our lawyers are spending too much time negotiating for documents, time that could be much better spent advancing the investigation. These delays also directly impact complainants who are waiting for relief, often when they are facing devastating situations at work. Despite the challenges created by TSA's privilege claims, OSC is committed to completing thorough investigations and protecting TSA employees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We appreciate the committee's interest in these challenges we're facing. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe we have a slide. Ms. Lerner, can you give an example of the kinds of redactions that TSA has provided your office with? Yes. Can you put the slide back up? So this is an example. This is one, uh, one of the attachments to our written uh, submitted testimony. This is an example of uh, the type of document production that we're getting from TSA. And it's a real problem because this document, we believe, would go directly to the issues that we're trying to investigate uh, in the case. Uh, was there a, a disclosure by the employee? Were they whistleblowing? And what were the reasons that the agency had for taking the action against the whistleblower after they blew the whistle? And when we get a document that's 100% redacted, there's no way we can get to the bottom of the information that we really need. Does it uh, appear to you at, at least that it that the use of the redaction is selective and inconsistent to the point that it might raise suspicion that it's being used to, to cover up problems at TSA? Would that be fair? I can't get to what's motivating them in their I'm just you know, reasons for redacting, but it does raise concerns. Thank you. Dr. Gawadia, is that how you pronounce that? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lerner provided examples of overly broad redactions by TSA. Were you aware that TSA withheld information from the Office of Special Counsel in this manner? Yes, sir. I am aware that we do uh, assert attorney-client privilege in some instances. Can you explain why the documents Ms. Lerner has provided were, today were redacted? Uh, 
So I, I do not know the exact specifics of the case that you, you couldn't have put from up. reading that right. slide. Certainly, and and um, um, we would have to go back into the the log and, and determine the exact nature. Ms. Lawrence stated in her testimony that even the date, author, the recipient of the document were, were redacted. Can you uh, explain how that information would be privileged? So, I, I, again, I don't know the context in which this particular document uh, well, I'm not talking is, about is, that particular document. And, and, there are other documents. Oh. Why, why, would you, why would you be redacting the date and the author and the recipient? Can you, can you give uh, an explanation of that? So I believe it might be on a case-by-case -case basis, those uh, uh, particular selective. issues. Uh, I would not say selective. I would say case-by-case. -case. Well, it appears to be selective and inconsistent. I mean, wh again, uh, why would you redact the date? Again, sir, I, I, I have no ability or to opine on the document put up That's, or in the generalities. It would have well, to be answered on a case-by-case -case basis. You, know, you talked about attorney-client privilege. If there were uh, no attorneys present at, at, at the meeting, how could TSA possibly invoke attorney-client privilege res with respect to the document? So again, I, I, have, I do not have insight into the particular document you're talking about. I'm not so. talking about that, just that document. But this has gone on with other uh, instances where, in one case, uh, the attorney couldn't even identify the client yet claimed attorney-client privilege. So let me go back to the question you asked previously about uh, um, if the attorney is not in the meeting. It might be that uh, an employee is asking uh, for attorney's advice on something. But uh, again, it's speculative well, What if the attorney I can't identify the client? Uh, I, I'm not sure what, where that reference is coming from, sir. I think we'll get into that later. Uh, Ms. Lerner, would you like to comment on that? So I think really what this boils down to is we don't believe that the attorney-client privilege applies in any uh, document, for any document request. We are acting in the agency's shoes. This is an intra-agency, intra-government investigation that Congress has asked us to conduct. It's not appropriate for any agency to claim attorney-client privilege when they're producing documents to OSC. It would be the same thing with an IG or GAO. An agency would never claim attorney-client privilege uh, during an IG investigation, it's not appropriate to claim it during an OSC investigation either. Well, that's part of my problem with this is, as I said, selective use of redaction, uh, the inconsistent use of it, uh, claiming attorney-client privilege. It, you know, with all due respect, it appears that TSA is, is trying to cover up problems. Uh, uh, Mr. Roth, do you have any comment on that? Um, we've been very fortunate that DHS has taken the policy since I've been there that the attorney-client privilege does not apply to anything that we receive. Of course, they're a little more restrictive on publication because they don't want to breach the attorney-client privilege for a number of reasons, and that's obviously their decision whether or not to do so. But they have taken the position that attorney-client does not bar us from access to information. Well, I appreciate uh, your answer, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. We'll now go to Ms. Demings of Florida for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our witnesses who are here before us today. We do understand and know how important transparency is, but also how important uh, whistleblower protections are to the overall process. I'm pleased today to hear uh, from both sides of the aisle um, to speak out in support of whistleblowers and the important work done by the Office of Special Counsel. But despite the talk that we've heard, congressional Republicans have failed to provide OSC with the funding that you so desperately need to carry out uh, the work. President Obama's congressional budget justification of the Office of Special Counsel for fiscal year 2017 requested additional funding for the agency, noting a record number of whistleblower disclosures, up 74% over the prior two years. Ms. Lerner, was that correct? And has OSC seen an increase in its caseload over the past several years? And do you currently have a backlog in handling whistleblower complaints? Thank you so much for the question. Yes, our caseload has about doubled during the time that I've been special counsel. Um, we got about over 6,000 
complaints last year over all four of our program areas, which is a really big increase. Our lawyers are beyond you know, the ability to, to work cases the way they need to be working them. We do appreciate that the House, in the House's bill, they fully funded us at the President's number. Um, the Senate bill kept us uh, level um, as at last year's levels. We really do need an increase in funds pretty desperately in order for us to fulfill our good government mission and to do the kinds of things that Congress has asked us to do to be effective. We need, we need appropriate staff, and we don't have it right now. I understand that according to the fiscal year uh, 2017 budget justification that you requested 15 new full-time employees to meet its caseload. Is that correct? That's correct. And even though this increase received bipartisan support in the House, the Republican-led Congress failed to pass the appropriations bill last year, so OSC did not receive the increase in staffing as requested. Is that correct? That is correct. And also in the Senate bill, they kept us at the same level as last year. They did not follow the House's lead in terms of giving us the number that the President requested. Okay. And President Trump was instrumental in pressuring Congress to delay action on these spending bills, meaning that current spending levels will remain in place until at least April. Ms. Lerner, have budget constraints affected your ability to enforce uh, whistleblower protections, and if so, in what way? I think our lawyers are doing an amazing job with the resources that they have. Um, as you noted, we did request additional funds so that we could hire at least 15 more lawyers. As I mentioned in my opening statement, we have about 40 attorneys right now assigned to do the investigation and prosecution of the hundreds of retaliation cases that are coming into our agency. It creates frustration for complainants. It creates delays in terms of getting people the relief that they need. And frankly, our, our staff is frustrated because they would like to be able to spend appropriate time on the cases. Um, so it would be very, very helpful if our agency were fully funded. I think you stated in 2012 that you've received more than 350 whistleblower retaliation cases from TSA employees. Would you say that that's correct? Yes, that's right. And how many did you receive last year, roughly? I don't know, I don't know the exact number, but it's about, it's about on the same level. And do OCS's resource constraints affect how quickly you can resolve the open cases, the extreme high number of open cases that you currently have? Yeah, let me give you an example. When I first started as special counsel in 2011, our complaints examining unit had about 25, maybe, maybe 30 cases per complaint examiner. Now they are up to 60, sometimes 70 cases per examiner. Um, that's a double tripling of the caseloads. That means it takes us much longer to determine whether a case um, should be fully investigated. It takes us longer to get relief for complainants at a time in their life when they're really under terrible, you know, workplace uh, situations. Someone who, you know, may need immediate relief. We may not always be able to get to their case as quickly as, as we ought to. It's taking around 90 days on average for cases to get through our complaints examining unit. When I first started, it was an average of closer to 30 days. Thank you so much. Mr. Gentlewoman yields back. I now recognize myself. Uh, Ms. Gawadia, you said that uh, TSA has zero tolerance on those that are applying retaliation to whistleblowers, correct? Yes, sir. Um, do you believe that the TSA, it, so if, if an employee believes that they have been retaliated against, who is the, or what organization is the one that comes in to figure out whether or not there has been retaliation? So, so uh, employees at TSA are afforded all protections from the Whistleblower Act, all TSA employees are, so they can go up any number of channels, they can go up to the EEOC uh, line, the MSPB line, or the OSC line, they can even... Okay, so let's take the OSC for, for example. Certainly. The whistleblower says, I've been retaliated against. The TSA says, no, they haven't. There's a dispute. OSC is one of the organizations, I think the primary organization, to resolve that dispute, correct? Certainly. You yes, agree sir. with that? Yes, sir. So what percentage of the information should the OSC be able to review in order to figure out the right conclusion. So the OSC should have all the information they need to figure to it out. To define all of the information. 
So I appreciate where you're headed with your question on, on the, the information we redact for uh, attorney-client privilege issues. Um, in that regard, I have to say we follow departmental guidance. Wait, 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 wait. There's the law, and then there's departmental guidance. You said you believed that the OSC should get all of the information. What percentage is all? So, so I said... No, no, no. It's a simple question. I hear you. I what, what, want... No, no. I, I want to be clear in what I'm asking. If she is to get all of the information, which you said, well, actually, what, percentage, what percentage is all? All would be mathematically 100%, but my sentence was all the appropriate information. Appropriate. What, 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 so what do you believe the OSC should not see? So the attorney-client privileged information is presently redacted. I know you don't want to hear numbers, so I'm not going to give you numbers, but it is a very small fraction. The only number I want to hear from you is that we give the OSC 100% of the information. That's what I want to hear you say. You said you give them all, that they should have all. How, how are they supposed to come to a proper conclusion when you only give them something short of 100%? So in this regard, again, I, I, I have to stress that TSA is not an agency independent. We belong to a department. We follow guidance that the department gives us. Now, as, as a part of this hearing, we have this, your concern has been raised. I, I can assure you that we will follow up with this at the department level, make guidance in writing if we have to, make it so that we are. Okay, so uh, you said it's department guidance. When will you provide this committee that department guidance that says that the attorney-client privilege prohibits you from giving the information to the OSC? When will I have that on my desk? So I, I, have, I have already raised the matter with the department's general counsel, and I will work with them to get you... Um, no, I want a date certain. Uh, unfortunately, sir, this is not up to me. I am not the... You're the acting administrator of the TSA. You've got 50-plus thousand employees. You don't have the... Uh, you're relying on guidance from the department, and you're going to withhold that information from Congress? Sir, so, so to, my, to my best of my knowledge, the guidance is not in writing. We are working to get so wait a the second. practice. You don't have, you, you just made this up? It's not in writing? So, so it, is, it is a standard practice? No, it's that not. The Mr. Roth, or Ms. Ms. Lerner, is this a standard practice? No, it's not. There is no attorney-client privilege when one government agency is investigating another government agency. It's very much akin to what the IGs do. Do you see this with does. any? Do you see this with any other department or agency or whatever you want to call it? From time to time, but not to the extent that we're seeing it with TSA. Mr. Roth, what's your experience with this? Um, we are part of the Department of Homeland Security, so we get everything, whether it's uh, attorney-client or not. Ms. Gawadia. I want you to provide the guidance to this office uh, next Friday. Is that fair? A week from tomorrow? So I will work with the department to get you something by next Friday. What, um, let me ask you this. What do you think Congress has the right to see? If I ask for all the information, what percentage of the documentation will you give us? So again, when it comes to attorney-client privilege, I... I I am not in a position to... Uh, yes, you apply. are. You're the acting administrator. I'm asking you right now to provide the information that the OSC has asked for. I want you to provide it to this committee. So, so may I offer uh, uh, something? Uh, yesterday we came to visit with Mr. Meadows, and as a part of getting ready for this hearing, this concern has come to my attention in a very strong way. Um, I went back and I asked my staff to do a quick look and see, have we ever had any concern expressed by the OSC to us in the information we have redacted? Has that kept them from uh, uh, proceeding on a case? We found two instances. I believe Ms. Lerner has four in her statement. I have as of yesterday, if we ever redact a piece of information from the OSC, we will always accompany it with a privilege log. And that will allow uh, OSC to have more information on, on the information that has been redacted. Okay, so when will, you when will you provide the OSC the privilege log? 
When will you do that? If I may, that would not be sufficient. It's oh, I'm not that saying that's an endpoint. No, that a privilege log suggests that there actually is a privilege. Right. It's our position that there is no attorney-client privilege. But I would like be appropriate. To, your point is well taken, and I concur with it. But I would be interested to see all the different times that the TSA is taking this so-called privilege, which we don't buy into. When will you provide that to the OSC and to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform? When will I have that on my desk? The privilege logs? Yes. With every document that we issue henceforth, we will issue No, 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 not log. in the future. I want to know all the ones in the past. So I, I, am, I am not familiar with how many, how many records It doesn't matter how many. I want to know when I'm going to have all of them. Well, sorry. A week you from, you have a week from Friday, okay? A week from Friday, or I'll issue a subpoena. And guess what? I don't need a committee vote. I don't need to go ask a judge. I can do it myself. And I'm telling you here on national television, you will get a subpoena for that information. You should provide it voluntarily. We do not buy into this whole notion that there is any such privilege. Secondly, the information that the OSC is asking for, where they don't have 100% of the documents, when will we as a committee have that? So again, I would have to take that question for the record because uh, this is a departmental position that I am not unilaterally allowed to, uh, to serve. Who, tell me who at the Department of Homeland Security is holding you back? So I have to work with the Office of General Counsel. Give me some names. I want to know who to call up here. The Office of General Counsel. No, no. The General Counsel to the Secretary. Give me a specific name. That's a big office. There's lots of attorneys. Tell me the attorneys that are telling you not to provide this information to Congress, and tell me the names of the attorneys that are telling you not to provide this to the OSC. I so, want names. So it, I will follow up with, your, with you. No, your I want you after. right now. You've had notice of this hearing. I need specific names. You had staff sitting there. How many staff are with the TSA? So it, how, uh, how many staff are with the TSA or in this audience right now? Please raise your hands. Who's paid by the TSA? How many people? Wait a sec. One, two, three. Hold them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One of these seven people has got to get on the phone, get your butt up out of this committee, and go get that information before this hearing's done. I want to have names, and we're going to call them up there. There is no way. We're going to go to the ends of the earth to protect whistleblowers, and we have, an end of, we have this OSC Ms. Lerner has testified time and time again, we believe in her and her organization. She needs 100% of the information. Not some of it, not some that you don't want us to have, not the embarrassing, she needs all of it. And I want names of who at the Homeland Security is prohibiting people from giving that information to the OSC. Mr. Chaffetz, I have asked my staff to step out and uh, obtain permission from the department to give you a name before the hearing is done. Thank you. And I need to know what information, let me ask you this one conceptual question. I'll turn the time to Mr. Uh, no, no to, to the Democrat. What information do you believe should be withheld from Congress? So I, I, I don't believe information should be withheld from Congress unless there are certain provisions, such as the attorney-client privilege, which, again, my hands are tied by departmental policy. I cannot take unilateral action because there are ripple effects across the department. That having been said, I will tell you that when it comes to SSI information, all of this is, we are completely transparent, not with just with you, but with the IG, with your staff. They have full privilege to all the information when it comes to SSI and things like that. But when it comes to the attorney-client privilege element, so I... I I think we've established here that that is so bogus. You're making it up. That may be what the attorneys are telling you. You're a very talented, smart person. I appreciate the, the work that you do on behalf of, of the United States of America. But we've got whistleblowers who think they're getting retaliated against. And I want you to stop hiding behind uh, some legalese and throwing attorneys into meetings so you don't have to provide documents. We don't see this problem at this magnitude anywhere else except the TSA, and that's why we're going to get to the bottom of it. I've gone well past my time. We're going to recognize Ms. Lawrence of Michigan for five minutes and some more if she needs it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Gowadi, um, transportation security officers are frontline of employees who protect our airports and our skies are not covered by many of the civil service protections available to most federal employees. 
What kind of rights do TSOs have when they are subjected to adverse employment actions? Ma'am, they have full whistleblower protection rights, and uh, they have the ability to bring their concerns before an appellate board uh, to, uh, to raise some of their concerns. Who's on the appellate board? Uh, other TSA employees. What prevents a TSO from being a subject to an arbitrary personnel action, one taken perhaps because an employee has fallen out of favor with a manager? What protects them? Ma'am, the entire system protects them. This is all about leadership. We have to make it so that our leadership is well-educated, well-trained, and well-able to make decisions that do not adversely affect an employee on, on a... Uh, I understand that, but what, what, what prevents an employee from getting um, arbitrary personnel action? They have the ability to appeal their situation before the appellate board. Do you agree that fairness and consistency and due process are important components of the personnel system for Ab federal employees? Absolutely. Inspector uh, Rob, do arbitrary personnel practices deter whistleblowers from speaking out about security deficiencies? I believe that it's got a chilling effect uh, any time there is the threat of some sort of improper personnel practice as a result of making a protected disclosure, for example, of a safety situation or other kind of misconduct on the part of the agency, that there is always that fear that there is a chilling effect that something will happen to that person. So if TSA employees are reluctant to raise these deficiencies they observe, couldn't this put aviation security at risk? Well, that's absolutely the case, and uh, we get at DHS something like 20,000 complaints a year from various DHS employees raising exactly those issues. But we do worry, of course, as Ms. Lerner does, that uh, uh, those folks can be retaliated against uh, if, in fact, the word of their cooperation gets out. I, I'm going to make a statement now. Um, TSA is arbitrary and inconsistent personal actions against its employees not only affect morale, but they also create serious risks to aviation security. Every member of Congress is, is you know, intimately uh, aware of the f securities and the, the responsibilities that are placed on our TSA, and we trust them because we, in our job, must fly back and forth on a regular basis. In TSA, we have a test case of what happens when an agency's employees are excluded from due process protection of Title V. The results are a disaster, and they should never be repeated at any federal agency. To correct what we have seen at TSA, Congress should act now to ensure full civil service protection under Title V are available to all TSA employees, including TSA officers. And also, to my Republican colleagues, when we talk about rolling back federal civil service protections, understand as we have made a commitment here on this committee to, to ensure that we protect whistleblowers, when we draw back as Mr. Roth has said, these protection it has a chilling effect because if I'm not going to be protected, I'm not going to come forward. With that, I yield back my time. Thank you. We'll now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Uh, last week, the committee conducted an interview of uh, former Deputy Administrative TSA uh, Mark Hatfield, and he told the committee that TSA was, quote, governed by self-direction and, quote, which, quote, bred bred misbehavior, quote, and led to toxicity rather than a healthy agency, end of quote. Mr. Roth, you uh, testified before the committee in November of 2015. Failures that you uncovered at the time that Mr. Hatfield.